of sorrow Sara Sabo Oh Sabo Mare Casanova I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit of an overview first, um, and then sharing with, with you what I, um, the core of what I, I'd like to share. I'm going to be talking about today why in the past every society that survived, survived by preparing its sons to be disposable. Whether it was disposable in war, or disposable at work. In other words, every society that was healthy enough to survive became healthy by preparing its boys to be unhealthy, since death wasn't that healthy. How this contributes, we're going to look today at how this contributes to both sexes falling in love with members of the other sex who are the least capable of loving. And then we wonder why we are in such a mess. We'll see today why men in industrialized nations are psychologically about a half century behind where women in industrializations are. About where women were in 1960. And how that can change and why that must change. A look at the evolutionary shift that's necessary to create not a woman's movement, not a men's movement, but a gender transition movement. Making a transition from the old rigid survival roles of the past to more flexible fulfillment roles of the future. In the context of love, I'm going to be looking at how we can make a transition in a sense from role mate to soulmate. You're going to see some of the summary of that in a little piece of paper that you should either be sitting on or have in your hand at this moment. At IESE 2, the question is, the core question here for us is how do spiritual leaders lead the evolutionary shift of this generation? We'll look at four gender transitions that I think it'll be necessary for, for spiritual leaders like ourselves to facilitate. Number one, the woman's transition from rigid survival roles to flexible fulfillment roles, which is already well underway. Number two, the boy and man's transition from rigid survival roles to flexible fulfillment roles. Three, the society's transition from infrastructures that support rigid survival roles from the past to infrastructures that support more flexible fulfillment roles that balance fulfillment and survival. Number four, everyone's transition from the old survival communication to empathy communication that allows us to make the first three transitions not with blame of each other, but with love for each other. Every time someone speaks a different truth, that we increase our empathy rather than increase our vitriol. Because of the one hour time constraint, I'm going to be giving you only the tip of the iceberg um, explanations of why love today is such a mess. And yet, paradoxically, why it is better than it's ever been before. And also, why we're missing such an enormous opportunity to make it a lot better than it has been or is. Let's start with my comment about why in the past both sexes fell in love with members of the other sex who were the least capable of loving. Um, I don't want to let something as intriguing as that just fall by the wayside. Um, it starts with the fact that the purpose, of the purpose of life in the past was not love. It was survival. It was not patriarchy or matriarchy. It was survivalarchy, if you will. It was the need to survive. And you can get a lot of that from that little handout that I've 
passed, passed out. To survive the first commandment to the Pentateuch of the Bible was, what was that first amendment? It was the first commandment. It was the first amendment. You can see people that are trained in political science. <laughs> The, um, it, the first commandment of the Pentateuch of the Bible was be fruitful and multiply. So men fell in love with what type of women? Women who were fertile, women who were young enough to be fruitful and multiply for the next number of years. So to this day, I, men don't today, of course, have any addiction to young women. <laughs> <laughs> or beautiful women. Certainly if we're spiritually evolved, we completely erase that from our <laughs> psyches. <laughs> and women fell in love with men who were successful enough to protect them. Of course, that doesn't happen today either. <laughs> Problem is, with this method, women get better at love as they get older. So boys and men falling in love with 15-year-old girls was falling in love with females who were the least capable of loving. Conversely, women who fell in love with boys and men who were killer protectors missed out on the part of men that were nurturer connectors. We're beginning to see that part of men today, often after divorce, when a man suddenly realizes that the only person left to love him is his children and suddenly realizes how much love he has in his heart for his children. And we see him connect to his children. We see the grandfather connect to our grandchildren in a way that we never knew a man was capable of. So both members were programmed historically to fall in love with members of the other sex who were the least capable of loving. That said, a woman's traditional role gave her a lot more love advantages than a man's traditional role gave him. But that doesn't mean that a woman loves a man more than a man loves a woman, an important distinction. Before I explain that, let me just do a quick survey here to make sure that we're on target. I'm going to ask you to stand up if you are a mother. Remain standing if you are a mother who worked outside of the home more than 40 hours a week each year of all the first three years of your child's life or all your children's life. I'm going to repeat that. Stand up if you are a mother who worked outside of the home more than 40 years a week each year. <laughs> Only my wife. <laughs> and then, oh, a few, few more women back there. Okay, so we have uh, about maybe six or seven of the women standing. Very good. Okay, <laughs> very nice. Stand up if you're a dad. Remain standing if you worked outside of the home more than 40 hours a week each year of all the first three years of your child's life or of all your children's lives? <laughs> Almost all the men remain standing. Yes, okay. I'll ask you to sit down. Thank you. <laughs> How do dads learn to love the family? Let's say you're my family. Dads learn to love the family by the Father's Catch-22. We learn to love the family by being away from the love of the family. Here's the workplace. We learn to love you by being away from you. Women learn to love you by being with you. Their love energy is connected, nurtured. They're the, the source of income if they're married to a man who's reasonably successful. Their source of income is dependent upon they're nurturing more, they're loving more, they're connecting more. Our source of income is, is dependent upon disconnecting. If we stay home and take care of you, we are disrespected. If we go out and disconnect from you, we are respected. We get our love by being disconnected from love. Women provided an emotional womb akin to love, but I'd like us to look at men's being disconnected from love as men providing a financial womb that took men away from their purpose, a financial womb that took men away from our purpose, loving and supporting the family, in order to achieve our purpose, loving and supporting the family. Men love the family by being disconnected 
Women love by being connected. That's what I mean by women's role had the love advantage. Women's traditional role from the past also has an emotional advantage. In love, when a man and woman divorce, a man is 10 times as likely as a woman is after divorce to commit what? Suicide. A man after the death of his spouse is also 10 times as likely as a woman is to commit suicide. It gives you a sense of the, what happens to men, we'll talk a little bit about this later, when we have emotional problems that we can't express. When a traditional, and so for men, our traditional, our real weakness is our facade of strength. Let me work on why that's the case. When a traditional man is vulnerable, it actually increases his vulnerability. He might ask, for example, he might ask a colleague for help at work, and then the colleague, seeing that he's at, been asked for help by this other person who might be uh, equal to or above him, goes to the boss and lets it get around that he was asked for help by, this other, by, by him, the colleague. Then the boss begins to, uh, to increase the sense that the, the colleague has some competence that he doesn't have. His willingness to ask for help, express vulnerability, has just increased his vulnerability. No wonder guys can't ask for directions. <laughs> In contrast, when women talk to women friends, there's a code with when women talk to women friends. A woman says, I'm really having trouble with my husband. If, the, the, if that trouble looks like it's going to create a divorce, the woman assures her that she really felt that she was, had married somebody that she really never really quite understood why she married him because he, she was really worthy of somebody even better than that. And so, and then the, each woman tells stories about how they are, they're frustrated with their own husband or flaws that they saw in that, that husband, in the, uh, husband from the past, and they give each other support to make that transition. So when a woman expresses vulnerability, she becomes stronger. But from the support she seeks and receives from other women, from support groups, from the church, from um, if areas of faith, and, and from her spiritual practice. A successful man then learns when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Not when the going gets tough, the tough go to spiritual conferences. <laughs> or when the going gets tough, the tough go to a psychologist. Basically, men learn success means learning to repress feelings, not express feelings. The setup for suicide. Men's face of invulnerability makes us care less about men. When a baby is born, a baby is completely vulnerable. What does it do? Brain chemistry-wise, it releases our oxytocin. It makes us want to even be willing to die to protect that baby. When men don't express their vulnerability, we have no oxytocin released. We have no ability to sort of reach forward and, and want to help them. So when men die, we don't care as much. When men die in, in a car accident, the, the penalty for the person creating their death is 54% less than it is when a woman dies. When a man, though, is the offender in a car accident, the penalty is 60% greater than when a woman is the offender in a car accident. So we tend to care more about saving, males than, saving whales than saving males. So few people know, for example, that men over 85 are 1,350% more likely to commit suicide than women over 85. If women over 85 were 1,350% more likely to commit suicide, would we know that? Yes, fortunately, we would know that. To change this, to make a transition, I think there are four gender transitions that need to occur. So let's look at how spiritual leaders can lead to create these four gender transitions. 
The first gender transition is women's transition from the rigid survival roles to the more flexible balance between fulfillment and survival. I mentioned a few minutes ago that women are about 50, women are about 50 years ahead of men in this process. So let's look quickly. Um, Mark mentioned that I was part of the, the women's movement. And I, what I saw as I was part of the women's movement was for the women's movement to, to move through and support women through three stages of progress that men haven't gone through. The first stage really is equivalent to what men did. The, the first stage was saying to women, you, you need to do more than just nurture at home. You meet, need to have the, the, at least the equal opportunity to create the uh, to, to be able to have power in a sense of earning money, to be able to have power in the sense of having status. And so the first stage of the women's movement was about uh, women creating money, have, creating status, having the option to, have, to doing that. And that was sort of, but a lot of the women's movement leaders said, wait a minute, that alone makes women imitation men. And we want, that's, that has limits. So the second stage of the women's movement said, well, wait a minute, we want women to also be respected if they're home taking care of their children. We want women to be respected if they're out um, working in the workplace. We want women to be, do some combination of both. Just because they make a choice, they shouldn't have to do everything. We want women to have what? Choice. We want women to have options. We want women to have choice. So the second stage of the women's movement was women having options. The third stage of the women's movement was I guess maybe the best way to, to share this is, um, is really understanding that power is not about imitating what men do or climbing ladders. It's really understanding that power is about, I guess maybe the best way I can explain this is, a, uh, is about control over one's life. And I, when I was explaining this to a group, one of the women in one of my groups um, raised her hand and said, I think I'm getting what you say. I don't think I like hearing what you say in relation to what my own life's about. Unfortunately, I think I agree with what you say. So I said, let's get a little ab less abstract here. Uh, can you share what your, your story is? And she said, yes, I I'm a medical doctor. But can I share with you, Warren, like how I became a medical doctor? And I said, go ahead. And she said, my dad is a doctor. And my older brother was clearly going to become the doctor in the family. And my father was paying attention to my older brother all the time. He always paid attention to me, but it was like I was the black and white TV and he was the color TV. And the attention to him was always a bit more focused. He was always preparing my brother for medical school, making sure his, his math, his science was down. He was doing all the right preparations, looking into colleges and graduate schools. And one day my brother at the diner, dining room table said to my dad, Dad, I want to share something with you. I, I want to tell you something that I think is going to be upsetting to you, but please hear me out. And my brother said, Dad, I want to tell you, I really don't want, I really want to be a writer, not a doctor. And my father was so disappointed. I could see the disappointment on his face, but I could see him try to cover the disappointment up. And so I made a joke to try to break the contention. I said, you know, Dad, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And suddenly my dad looked around at me and with a type of respect and a type of surprise and a type of relief and a type of admiration that I had never seen in my dad before. And I couldn't tell him at that moment that I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, each, but each day he came up to me and he said, now we started taking a real interest in what I was taking and what I wasn't taking and helping me with my homework. I felt sorry that my brother was now being left out and we, he was becoming the black and white TV. But at no point in time could I feel comfortable being able to, I didn't want to lose this attention. I didn't want to lose this focus. I didn't want to lose this affection. I didn't want to lose him saying to other people, my, my daughter, he's going to become a doctor. She's going to become a doctor. And so I, I couldn't ever feel comfortable letting him know that the real truth was I I didn't want to become a doctor either. And um, so she said, finally, I, I, I figured, okay, when I go away to college, I'll be free. I'll be able to come home on vacations. I'll be able to finally to tell him. But now he was preparing me with pre-med courses and pre-science courses. I hated them, but I was good enough at them to get to the next level. And, and by the time I was junior, a junior year in, in college, I was already getting acceptances from med schools. And then I went into the med schools. And then I couldn't, I knew that if I went through med school and graduated, I couldn't do very well without getting 
wondering, uh, if I didn't do well, I wouldn't get a residency and an internship in a, in a place as nice as where my dad lives, so I couldn't come back and be close to home. So I really focused on working, and I got a good residency and a good internship, and I was able to return to my community and be near my family and, and make a good practice and have a good reputation. And I'm realizing when I'm hearing you talk now is that I don't have power, do I? How many feels that she doesn't have power? How many feels she does have power? She has power and she doesn't have power. She has power by the society's evaluation of power, but from her perspective, she never became who she wanted to be. So options are not just about women saying they have choice or men saying they have choice. Options are about doing the spiritual journey of looking inside of oneself to discover who am I a prisoner of? Whose approval am I a prisoner of? Is it the approval of my social group, my parents, my spiritual group, my Ken Wilber? Um, no matter who it is, it all makes us flirt, the social part of us makes us give up ourselves, tempts us, seduces us as a siren to give up, giving us, giving up our true selves unless we do the spiritual journey to discover real power, the power of control over our own lives. Let's look at that from a historical perspective right into, into today. Today, millions of middle-class and upper-class women are in stage three doing the spiritual journey. Almost every woman here is in some version of stage three. We'll see in a moment that today, men are basically in stage one, where women were in 1960. Think mad men. <laughs> the question is, how did women get so far and men remain so stagnant. The women who made the most progress were what? Poor women or middle and upper class women? Middle, middle and upper class women. In industrialized countries or, de or uh, developing countries? Industrialized countries. So women who are middle class and upper middle class in industrialized countries were married to men who were what? Successful or unsuccessful? successful enough to be able to allow the women to go to psychologists, be introspective, raise expectations about their marriage that would ultimately lead to their divorce. <laughs> Why divorce? Because the women who were best able to afford the psychologists were the ones who had selected for successful men. That is, men who were what? Expressing their feelings or repressing their feelings? Repressing their feelings. And women can't hear what men don't say. The successful men learned that earning money led to earning love. Why did they learn this? because earning money led to earning love. <laughs> However, the flaw is that it didn't sustain love. Not with women's new definition of love, that the woman thought desired real communication. This, though, doesn't erase the fact that the women best able to grow spiritually and psychologically were the ones who had selected to marry men who were the least able to grow. Thus, divorce. Or one slice of divorce. Now let's look at this in a larger context. The context of what I would call the family vote. Basically, prior to the women's movement, we had sort of a type of equality. Men, women learned to row on the right side of the boat, which was raise children. Men learned to row on the left side of the boat, which was to raise money. After the benefits of the women's movement, what happened for women? Women learned to be able to raise children or raise money. They learned to be able to row on either side of the boat. Men learned to, st to still raise money. So we had this type of thing. 
Women are raising children now or raising money. They can row on either side of the boat. But let's say there's a recession and the recession happens and the, the woman is able to row on either side of the boat. The man loses his job. The woman can move over and lo, row, row on either side of the boat. Now with the woman exercising her newfound power to row on the raise money side of the boat, the left side of the boat, and the man not able to row on the right side of the boat, with both of them rowing on the left side of the boat, the boat goes in what? Circles. This is not the beautiful feminine circle. This is the, fem this is the circle that hits the rocks. These are the rocks of recessions. And what is a recession? The last recession was called a man session or a he session. Why? Because what percentage of people lost their jobs were, were, were which gender? 78% of the people who lost their jobs were who? Men. Males, boys, men. If we don't help both sexes row on both sides of the boat, we will have a family boat that will be more vulnerable to the sharp rocks of recessions. Caring for children or preparing for the whole of neglected children in a woman's soul as breadwinner, women as sole breadwinner family requires though some unfinished work in women's development as well as significant unfinished work in men's development. In the past half century, we've done a really good job socializing men to be proud of our wives and daughters who have full-time careers. We've done a poor job socializing women to be proud of husbands and sons who are full-time dads only. The evolutionary shift then? The shift begins with women knowing that when children are raised predominantly by dads in an intact family, they do, the children do extremely well in 30 different areas of measurement, in all the social areas, in all the psychological areas, in all the academic areas, and in all the physical health areas. Women, the single biggest predictor of empathy in a child is a good, fully involved relationship with a dad. Not because dads have more empathy, but because dads require the children to think about somebody other than themselves to a greater degree. It is the, when you give empathy, the child learns to receive empathy, not to be empathetic. Boundary enforcement is more likely to force the child to think of someone else other than himself or herself. I can't go more deeply into this, but at the workshop, I'll do this much, one much more deeply on that issue. As wives work more, women and children today are often more in need of men who are nurturer connectors than killer protectors. But both sexes rowing on both sides of the boat requires both sexes learning to love and respect each other when they do it. One thing that's often helpful for women to hear is if women said, we really respect, love, and will be sexual with men who walk on their hands, Mark and I would be organizing hand walking um, uh, co contests within 10 minutes. And within 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 years, we'd be trying to walk on one hand and, and outdoing each other. When women care, we care. Gender transition two. The boy and man's transition from rigid survival roles to flexible fulfill fulfillment roles. This section is going to be pretty shocking. If I say that boys are five years, uh, 50 years, boys and men are 50 years behind girls and women, that implies that there's a potential crisis. Is there? Let's look. Prior to, let's look at men's and boys' emotional health first. When our sons are pre-age nine, boys and girls commit suicide at equal rates. Between the ages of 10 to 14, boys' rate is twice as high as girls. Between the age of 15 and 19, it goes to four times as high as girls. Between the ages of 20 and 24, 
it is between five and six times as high as girls. That's half the disaster. The other half of the disaster is that we don't know about it, that we don't seem to care about it. The dimension of that, you could just get a sense though of as the male role becomes more defined, as male expectations become more defined, the fear of not being able to, to live up to what we're expected to live up to becomes so great that we can't handle it, that we check out. Let's look at education. We all know that boys are behind girls in schools, but we don't realize that they're two to three years behind girls in the two most crucial areas, reading and writing. And in those areas are not mastered. Almost nothing else can be learned as effectively. Jobs. Our sons are not being prepared to do jobs where the jobs will be. Schools are cutting back on vocational training. And when they do institute it, it's vocational training for the previous male jobs of manufacturing, of carpentry, of, of wood shop. It is not education for the future male jobs where jobs will be robotics, health, education, blueprint reading. Next, fatherlessness. A third of boys and girls, by the way, are raised today, a third, in father-absent homes. In neighborhoods where fathers are most scarce, more than half of boys don't finish high school. You don't even want to know the data about what happens to boys that don't finish high school. Physical health. Life expectancy in the United States between men and women used to be in 1920, in the United States, just one year gap between males and females. Today the gap is 5.2 years. These are just a few of the tips of the iceberg of the crisis that is so far pretty much unacknowledged. If a boy does manage to overcome these barriers and he's successful becoming married with, to a wife who's also successful, something happens when they have their first child. His wife tends to ponder when she's pregnant for the first time, three options. Option one is work full time. Option two is to be full time involved with the ch child or children. Option three is to do what? Some combination of both. Men not to be out, and by the way, the Census Bureau finds that that's 40, 40, and 20. 40% 40 of women with children uh, work full-time, 40% are home with the children full-time, and 20% work part-time. Um, men, though, not to be outdone, we have three options also. Option number one is to work full-time. Option number two is to, to, to work full-time. <laughs> and option number three is what? work full-time, or if he's a working-class man, work two jobs. Yes, um, or if he's an upper-middle-class or middle-class man, work overtime. So these married men, once the ch there are children to support, what happens is that men begin to earn more proportionally to women, and then we say, aha, this shows that there's a pay gap and men have the power. They earn more, though, largely because once children arrive, they feel more obligation to earn more. They move into the Father's Quest 22 of learning to love the family by being away from the love of the family, increasing their income to now support two or three people, whereas before their income only had to support one person. Is there any evidence to what I'm saying? Here's just one piece, one sliver. Women who have never been married and never had children earn 117% of what men who have never been married and never have children earn. Women who have never been married and never have children earn 117% of what men who have never been married and never had children earn, even when you control for number of years, marry, uh, number of years um, in the workplace, the age, and the education. Men's definition of power has become feeling obligated to earn money someone else spends while we die sooner. 
We're all advanced enough to not buy that as a real definition of power, but rather power being control over one's life. So pay is paradoxical. Pay, the pay paradox is this. Pay is about the power we forfeit to get the power of pay. For example, we forfeit the power to develop a spiritual life to get the power to pay for our children having a spiritual life. The pay paradox then is, is pay is about the power we forfeit forfeiting our own spiritual life for the power of pay, the power of options to do other things. The first step of this transition involves understanding male power versus real power. As I mentioned before, real power is control over our own lives. The people in our workshop yesterday, we did a workshop experience in which I asked all the people in the workshop to find the glint in their father's eye and what that glint was created from. It was usually art, helping other people, being in nature, traveling, um, almost all with people contact. And then we looked at the fact that um, most of our fathers did something that earned more money than people contact would provide. They were the engineers. They were doing things not that created the glint in their eye. They had forfeited the glint in their eye, their dreams, for doing what earned more that would allow their children to create their dreams. Men who were in the past generation knew this so well that they didn't even allow themselves to entertain their dreams because they knew it was going down a dysfunctional path. Virtually every society that survived, I said before, let me take us to a related issue. The first step in our gender transition for boys and men is confronting our society's dependency, its dependency on male disposability in work or war. Virtually every society survives, therefore, if it's dependent, we have an unconscious investment in training ourselves, uh, training our sons to be disposable. Let's look at whether that unconscious investment is at play today. Are we, are we, are we requiring our sons to be willing to register for the draft? Yes, we do. Only our sons. Whether being disposable protecting our country from an enemy or disposable protecting our homes from fire whether being disposable on construction sites, building homes, offices, our asilomars, or in coal mines, heating our homes, our offices, or our asilomars, whether it's by making a killing in the hunt or making a killing on Wall Street. Some societies like Japan at least have an acknowledgement for making a killing on Wall Street. They call making a killing at, uh, the stress at work that comes when you're trying to perform at the level of, of CEOs and so on or even what they call salary men in Japan, they call the frequent death at work koroshi. They have a word for it called death from overwork. In the United States, 92% of deaths in the workplace are of men, but that's only the tip of the iceberg because it doesn't count, for example, all the firefighters who get contract black lung disease or other forms of, of, of problems that then manifest when they're not in work. Like girls, our sons are social animals. Historically, we socialized our sons to be disposable. We taught our sons to call it glory, to die in war, like the civil rights, civil war movie um, called Glory. Even today, let's see if we, if we ourselves participate in this process. Do we cheer boys and men who win at sports likely to create injury? Think football, X Games, ultimate fighting championships, think ice hockey, think rodeos, think car racing. If a quarterback, I'm always surprised when I watch college football or um, here's young kids, younger than my daughters are, um, if a quarterback in college throws with a dislocated shoulder, 
we call it courage rather than call a doctor. As adults, we praise men for volunteering to die. What am I talking about? Look at every, every community that's small. In that community, there are volunteer what? 76% of all firefighters in the United States are volunteers. Almost 100% men. What is their pay though? Their pay is praise. Their pay is respect. Their pay is social bribes to protect us at the expense of their life. Boys who successfully protect a society by risking death are called what? Heroes. It actually says it all in the etymology of the word hero. Etymologi etymologically, the word hero derives from the word siro, S-E-R-O-W, from which we get our word servant. And also, our word slave and our word protector are etymologically derived from the word hero. Think of a hero. Think of a, a car, a police car, saying public servant. The ser he's a public servant who is in some way a slave to protecting us. He's a slave because the social bribe before the age of consent to make him need and want respect is what he's a prisoner of. Since all humans are social animals, calling boys hero is a social bribe to risk death so the rest of us can live. Now, who teaches this to boys? The people that teach this to boys probably more than anybody else are the two most potent forces in a boy's life. His parents and cheerleaders. What's a cheerleader to a boy? <laughs> Just think about the cheerleader. You know, we're in junior high school and we're finally beginning to feel the hormones grow. And we're going to, so we see that the cheerleaders are out there. Are they, are they cheering for the people who are in the listening squad? I don't know. The, are, they, are, they, are they cheering for the boys who are on the empathy squad? No, they're cheering for the boys who are risking spinal cord injuries, concussions, dislocated shoulders, and they're saying, first and ten, do it again, first and ten, do it again. <laughs> and are the boys watching those cheerleaders? You're damn straight they're watching those cheerleaders. And, but they're watching them mostly from here down and from here up, but to up to here. <laughs> As Mark said, body parts. Um, but they're also learning that those cheerleaders do more than just have their bodies be available. Their love is available to the boys who are most likely to be willing to be disposable. So the boys are beginning to learn that when I subject myself to concussions, broken bones, and spinal cord injuries, if I'm strong enough to succeed at doing the, what I need to do goal-wise, I will get love. He learns to associate being physically abused with being loved. Have girls advanced beyond that? Has the women's movement helped women advance beyond that? You're damn straight the women's movement has helped women advance beyond that. But we haven't even thought of the question for boys and for men. It's not just parents and teachers that do this. Our school systems support this. Taxpayer money supports this. Therefore, we all support it. If you don't support it by taxpayer money, raise your hand and I'll have the IRS talk with you. <laughs> At what age does, boy, do a boy, does a boy learn to associate being abused with being loved? Prior to the age of consent. Think Pop Warner football starts age eight, the same age that some countries in the Middle East send their boys off to the front lines to strike fear in the part of the people killing the other side that they are killing a boy. If a boy in the United States can be said to have a choice to comply with a social bribe, he has no choice but to provide, abide by the legal mandate to register for potential death at the age of 18. 
to be available for first call on a list of resources should we need that. The irony of traditional masculinity is that what a society does to socialize a boy to contribute to a healthy society is the opposite of what it does, what it needs to do to socialize a boy to be healthy as an individual. Men's weakness is our facade of strength. For example, when a man reflexively rescues a woman or puts out a fire, he generates testosterone. But that generation of testosterone upon an emergency calling weakens our immune system. It increases our adrenaline to do that, or our epinephrine. But that makes us vulnerable to blood clotting and therefore to heart failure. This new permission that I'm asking us to consider, a permission for boys and men to take care of their health, a permission that would lead to there being a office for men's health instead of seven offices for women's health and none for men's health, is part of our evolutionary shift. Until we confront our dependency on male disposability, we can't give our sons permission to discover their spiritual and emotional lives, to progress to where women have come to today. Our sons today are still being treated largely as human doings once they have children. In order to get social respect, we need to have our men be human doings now. I'm asking us to release our men to be our sons to become human beings. Because I'm running late on time, what I'm going to do is just give you a, a quick cliff notes of the gender three trans, uh, transition. Gender, the um, gender transition three is a society's transition from infrastructures that support rigid survival roles. Three of the most important infrastructures that I'll talk about later at the workshop, but I can't now, is a male birth control pill. Think of what freed women most in the 20th century. Women should, women should not have the responsibility for birth control alone. Men should be sharing that. Men should be invested from the very first day in the shared decision to create a child. Um, paternity leave. In Sweden, paternity leave is at 80% of pay. And, in one, uh, and therefore, when that happens, divorce and separation has gone down in Sweden since paternity leaves have gone up and companies have been finding that men want to be involved with their children. That's their new perk. And team executive positions. Team executive positions are an extremely important development that I don't have time to get into now, but it's a crucial aspect of gender transition three. Gender transition four. Everyone's transition from survival communication modalities to empathy communication modalities. To allow us to, this, the Achilles heel of all human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. Especially when that personal criticism is from a loved one. And especially when that loved one is giving it badly. Of course, by definition, anyone criticizing us is giving it badly. <laughs> Survival communication is in our genes. When somebody criticizes us, it signals to us a possible enemy. So we respond to that enemy by getting up our defenses, or ideally killing the enemy before the enemy kills us. Not that any of us have ever wanted to kill our partners when they criticize us. Um, we. For 10 years, I've been working on creating a workaround to our natural biological response to respond to criticism defensively. Without a workaround to that natural response, we cannot make our transitions gently. That, so the crucial aspect of that workaround is understanding seven mindsets and understanding two disciplines, the discipline of loving each other and the discipline of appreciating each other the art of appreciating each other and the art of being able to love each other. 
Falling in love is biologically natural. Sustaining love is biologically unnatural. Until we learn how to be able to associate being criticized by our loved one with being loved, we will not make that transition effectively with each other or as a society. I can't, don't have the time here to share how that's done, but one mindset to end with. That one mindset is sitting inside of ourselves and then bringing it to the emotional level as well as the intellectual level, that each time our partner criticizes us, the more I hear our partner more fully, no matter how, what they say, the more my partner will feel a safe environment for saying what she or he needs to say. The more they feel a safe environment for saying what they need to say, the more they'll feel loved by me. The more they feel loved by me, the more they'll feel love what? For me. That's the type of workaround that needs to be ingrained in the psyche and get into our cellular structure. So that's the four gender transitions that we need. This isn't love in our past, dominated by the need to survive that created a division of labor and a division of interest between the sexes. It isn't love at present, dominated by women expressing their feelings of discontent and men putting our heads in the sand, hoping the bullets will miss. But it can be the future of love. I'm privileged to share a sliver of my life work with you who are so needed to facilitate the four gender transitions to the future of love. Thank you.